This is almost the part where I stop talking. It's, it's my pleasure at, at this time to uh, introduce our speakers for, uh, for this evening. I'm going to read their, their bios. Um, and um, um, I, if, if, if you don't like the bio that I read about you, you can see me, you can see me later. Uh, but I took it from published uh, and archival sources. Um, George Elliott Clark was born in Windsor, Nova Scotia. Uh, near the Black Loyalist and Afro Metis community of Three Mile Plains, uh, a graduate of the universities of Waterloo, Dalhousie, and Queens, he is now the inaugural E. J. Uh, Pratt Professor of Canadian Literature at the University of Toronto. He lives in Toronto, uh, but he also owns land in Nova Scotia, and he gets to visit Ottawa whenever he likes. <laughs> he was appointed as a poet laureate of the City of Toronto. Uh, in 2012 to 2015, appointed as parliamentary or national poet laureate uh, 2016 to 17, appointed as a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, and the recipient of eight honorary doctorates. Our next, our following speaker will be Don Kwan. Uh, Don uh, is uh, a queer third generation Chinese Canadian artist whose work has influenced by his upbringing in a family-owned restaurant in Ottawa's Chinatown. He uses mixed media, found objects, and sourced personal text and photographs to explore questions of identity, belonging, and place, reflecting on his family history while weaving intriguing stories. He turns his own experiences, returns to his own experiences, as a way to ground in broader conversations about identity, representations, and intergenerational memory making in the diaspora. And our third speaker is Alison Everett, who joined the Carleton University Faculty of Social Work in 2018. Uh, her primary role is as the Master of Social Work Practicum Coordinator. Alison's teaching has provided students with a transformative learning experience that addresses anti-Black racism and other intersecting oppressions encountered by marginalized groups. For Allison, the creation of spaces for conversations about race and culture is an essential element in the student and educator relationship and are foundational for developing honest and collaborative working relationships. The principles and the purpose of such conversation is to move students and educators away from their comfort zones and to assess critically how intersecting issues of power, privilege, unconscious biases, and oppression may impact their professional relationship with members of diverse communities. Allison is motivated by the strength of her community and believes wholeheartedly in centering the lived experience of communities in order to create equitable change. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, George Elliott Clark. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And um, what a pleasure it is to be in Ottawa and to uh, talk to you about archives uh, and so on. I do have a, a paper all ready to go. And, and I'm not really going to talk about it very much. I'll just say a few things off the top of my head immediately, which is this. No history is straightforward unless it's over. But some are more disorderly than others. And I think that's particularly true of the literature that I describe as African-Canadian, if you prefer black Canadian or Afro-Canadian. Uh, and, and because of the fact that it's not completely straightforward, one is, I think, compelled to do a lot of research, to try to establish bibliographies, to try to establish who published what, when, where they came from, uh, what happened to them, how many works they published, and so on. But it's only by doing that work of bibliography that you create a community. For anyone who's interested in doing any kind of academic, radical work, the first place for you to start is to build a bibliography of sources, of information that can help you uh, educate your community, whatever community it is. And there can be lots of intersections in that community in order to undertake whatever kind of political action they may feel it's necessary for them to undertake or to simply to instantiate 
the existence of that community, uh, that uh, set of cultural practices, uh, that particular political trend. And the best way to do that is by going into the archives, going into the libraries, and, and getting your hands dirty or getting the white gloves dirty or the plastic gloves dirty, uh, looking at some of those materials. Uh, and getting to understand exactly how whatever community it is that you're from or that you associate with, how it has come into being. What are its intellectual dynamics? What is the spirit behind that community? What are its philosophical or theological concerns that have helped to give it shape and heft and drive it forward uh, in history as a collective uh, in order to achieve group aims and, and group goals? and so on. I, as I say, I, I, I could, I could uh, look at this essay, but I want to talk about some uh, personal things as well. But I want to begin with 1968. Some of us will remember that. It was the year of Trudeau mania uh, here in Canada, of course, uh, at least for some folks. Uh, and, and, uh, and it was a year of international uprisings and revolutions or almost revolutions, such as in France. And the almost revolution in France in May 1968 had a lot of people wondering what happened? Why didn't a revolution take place? And they really would have thought of it as having been a more Marxist-oriented uh, kind of revolution. And they couldn't understand why the, the, the combo of students and workers wanting better lives uh, somehow was frustrated in that endeavor. And somehow de Gaulle came back and just told everybody, go back to work, and they did as of May 30th, 1968, after basically a month's holiday. A lot of people tried to think about what happened. Uh, and one of those uh, uh, thinkers uh, who, was, who was questioned about uh, the failure of a revolution take place was uh, Michel Foucault. And Michel Foucault said something that was extremely, for me, extremely compelling. And as he was asked by a Maoist student newspaper, just think, a Maoist student newspaper in, in Paris, you know, what happened, Michel? Why didn't we have the revolution? And, 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 uh, and, and the interviewers went on to say something along the lines of, until now, there have never been really the conditions uh, to allow revolution to occur. And Michel Foucault said something so simple and so profound. As soon as you say, until now, you are defeated. As soon as you say, until now, you are defeated. And what he meant by that, what I take from that, is that to say that until now this has never happened or until now we've never had these conditions, you are denying a potential history, the existence of a potential history of activism, of unrest, of movement. And the only way to actually get to know that history is to go into the archives, go into the libraries, read up, find all the uh, documents, no matter how hidden, repressed, erased they have been, in order to construct a history of activism. Uh, and in order to also uh, inform activists that there has always been forward momentum, there has always been progressive movement, no matter how stalled things may have seemed at any given time. Um, I'm reminded as well of, of uh, working on my second book of poetry, Wyla Falls, which is based on a uh, black community. And I set the story in 1930s, uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, and I knew I wanted to have photographs in that book. And so I went to the public archives in Nova Scotia in March 1990. The book came out in October 1990. And I was living in Ottawa at the time, actually. And, and uh, I went to the archives. And I was looking specifically for photographs of black women. Uh, young black women, uh, and I really wanted to have those photographs as part of the book. And what I saw, what I found in photograph after photograph were nannies and maids and, and persons working as domestics. And what I did not see were photographs of black women outside of those service roles just being themselves just hanging out, enjoying themselves. And then I came across a pile of photographs that had been left behind by a uh, woman photographer in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. She had her own photo business. Her name was Georgia Cunningham. And Georgia Cunningham is, uh, uh, did a lot of portrait uh, photography and so on, dudes in army uh, uniforms and during the Second World War and, and of course wedding photos and graduation photos and those kinds of things. And, and uh, but, uh, 
a black woman had left behind a roll of film to be developed and had never come back to pick it up. Uh, the film was developed, and uh, that film consisted of approximately 16 to 20 photographs of three or four black women just hanging out, having a picnic, uh, enjoying a, a nice summer stay. And for me, as a kind of romantic poet, it was wonderful to see these photographs of black women posed beside apple blossoms, posed uh, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a suggestion of romance, like in romantic poetry, and also posed in a way in which they saw themselves as being part of the landscape, not separate, not, not uh, simply engaged in toil, but actually enjoying the geography. And I suppose I can say the climate of that day. They even had on dark sunglasses at times. They posed beside wood piles and, and wells. And, and it was a country setting. And for them, it was completely natural. And for me, finding those photographs was an amazing occurrence for putting together that book. Because it helped to flesh out the reality that I was trying to create in that book of a rural black Canadian space uh, that is Canadian, that is black, that is rural, and, and represents some of the folkways of, of the people uh, living uh, that life and so on. And, and so then I became completely captivated by archives. Uh, while I was looking for those photographs, I came across yet another document in the Nova Scotia uh, Public Archives, Public Archives Nova Scotia, and I couldn't believe it and I, when I found it. It was a slave narrative which was published in Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1852. And the title of it, it's by John William Robertson, and the title of it is The Book of the Bible Against Slavery. And so there I am holding it, and you know, I'm just about to publish my second book of poetry. I just published my first book in 1983, and one of the reviewers of my first book said, hey, he's the first black Nova Scotian poet. I knew that wasn't true. Uh, but I sort of like rolled with it because why not? Why, why, why shouldn't I be the first black Nova Scotian poet? Well, even though I knew that wasn't quite true. But uh, so finding that document told me not only that, that there had been other, or I knew there had been other poets before me, but there were other writers before me. John William Robertson was uh, an escaped uh, slave fugitive uh, from the U.S., who made his way to Nova Scotia, not by the Underground Railroad, but by submarine. And of course, I'm kidding. Uh, he arrived by ship. He was a stowaway on a ship from Philadelphia, and then he arrives in Halifax. Uh, sorry, I said 1852. He arrives in Halifax, 1852, but he published the book of the Bible against slavery, this pamphlet of about 16 pages, uh, two years later. When he arrived in Nova Scotia in 1852, he was illiterate. Uh, but he, uh, a British captain, uh, John Barry, taught him uh, his letters. And, and then he decides, once he becomes literate, he decides he has to publish his own document condemning slavery. And condemning slavery as a crime against God. The way that pamphlet works is to basically review many biblical passages to say that there's nowhere in the Bible where you can find a real justification for slavery. But to continue with this, with this sort of personal odyssey through archives, I was shocked to find this document, which had never been discussed, never mentioned in any of the records of, of writings of African Nova Scotians, Africadians, I like to say, uh, going back uh, for, for centuries. It wasn't listed in any of the, of the records of, of slave narratives, even those published, in, of course, in the US. And there are only a handful were published in Canada. Uh, and this was one of them, but it had never really been talked about before. So it was a discovery for me. And once I had that pamphlet and got it photocopied carefully, but once I had that booklet in my hands, I then started to, I then realized there's something called Black Nova Scotian writing. And it has a history that goes back 200 years. There's something called Africadian literature that goes back 200 years. And it's, and it's my job to go and find those writers, to bring them into public uh, knowledge and to make them available for academic study, as well as for other black writers living and yet to be born, to understand that even if they think they are the first, there was always someone else there originally before trying to say something about our history, trying to say something about our struggle, 
trying to answer back to all the racist discourse, both political, social, and, and theological for that matter. And here these uh, ordinary people come together and, and put together these publications in order to put forward a black voice, a black voice of difference, an African descended voice of difference to say, we disagree with the entire uh, Western apparatus of justification for the transatlantic slave trade, imperialism against Africa, imperialism against indigenous peoples throughout Turtle Island, in, uh, imperialism against Asia, and so on. I, I'm not going to jump around here too much, but I was just thinking about, about the, um, uh, the contretemps between, going on right now between Canada and the People's Republic of China. And it always irritates me that no one, I never hear anyone mention the opium war. I never hear anyone mention the fact that England and France, with the connivance of the United States, invaded China in 1860 to force the Chinese to accept opium from Afghanistan, to force them at gunpoint to accept opium from Afghanistan. And then when some Chinese became addicted to opium, these same Western imperialists uh, launched a propaganda campaign to say, look, see, the Chinese can't be trusted because they're all on opium, right? We fast forward, fast forward 150 years, 160 years rather, let me get the extra 10 years in there, and here we are once again looking at and hearing demonization of China, uh, and, and behind it is this history of imperialist interference that never gets discussed. You know, if we did discuss that, we might have some better understanding of why it is that some uh, uh, members of the government of China might actually be kind of suspicious about Western attitudes and Western talk about human rights and Western talk about civil liberties. I, I know I shouldn't say stuff like this, and I, I, but I can't help it. Uh, when you really look at the history, and this is what the archives teach us, the archives teach us this history. That's why I say the most radical thing you can do as an activist. I'm following Michel Foucault. When I say this, the most radical thing you can do is to know your history, collect your history, archive your history, get access to that history, and imbue yourself with it. Because once you know that history, it'll be harder for you to be fooled. It'll be harder for you to be propagandized. It'll be harder for you to be bamboozled. Now, one of my intellectual heroes is Malcolm X. And one of the reasons why I appreciate Malcolm X and his teachings and his preachings is that he was a fierce advocate of all of us knowing our histories. We are all interconnected through this history that created uh, the so-called West, so-called North America, so-called Americas. We are all the products of that history. We need to know that history in order to build better societies, more inclusive societies, just societies, and so that we are also not distracted and fooled and deviated off into uh, aggressive actions against other people who probably just want to have as much peace as we want to have for ourselves and our children. I know I said I'm, I'm not gonna deviate too much or jump around too much, but I can't help it. I come back to, to assembling this, this literature, which I call African-Canadian, and this literature, uh, which I call Africadian. I'm thinking again about some of the lies, outright lies, or maybe I shouldn't call them lies, maybe I just call them errors. I'll just call them errors uh, of, of perception and so on uh, that, that uh, were uh, uh, committed by scholars, for crying out loud, scholars. And I'll just give you one quick example. Uh, one scholar, uh, I won't mention the name, but one scholar published a book, you can always Google it for yourselves anyway, but one scholar published a book in 1974 called Forgotten Canadians, the Blacks in Nova Scotia. Hoorah. That's right, hoorah, we are the forgotten Canadians. And in that, and in that book, uh, that uh, scholar said, there is no history of black music in the Maritimes. There is no history of black music in the Maritimes. These people were descended from field hands, from from Maryland and Virginia, and were so beaten down, so oppressed uh, in, in their servitude to their American uh, masters that, that, they had, that was squeezed out of them was any knowledge of song, any knowledge of, of music, and so on. And then the same scholar appended, appended to the article where she made this case that there's no history of black music in the Maritimes. She appended to that article four songs, four songs, 
that she recorded uh, per, being performed by a family in some rural part of Nova Scotia. But that didn't matter, even though even though the append uh, the appending of those of those songs kind of destroyed her argument. But never mind. Uh, she still went ahead and made it. But then. And I was doing my, my research on Africadian literature, I found publications of song lyrics that were compiled by ministers of the African Baptist Association, the African United Baptist Association, a church association founded in 1853, declared into existence from Granville Mountain in 1853, an association of 24 churches founded, built by uh, Africadians themselves in the face of white opposition, including white Baptist opposition to their forming a separate church association so they could worship God as they please. But to get to the point, and that church, by the way, has a, an amazing record of archives, an amazing record of archives, which of course I've been through. But to get to the point, when I found those, those uh, collections of song lyrics, a hymn sung at the services, for instance, and old Jubilee hymns and campfire songs uh, uh, from 1882 and 1903, I was struck by the fact that these lyrics had no music connected to them. It was just the, the, just the, the words, uh, spirituals, hymns, and so on. And I had to think, it was expensive to publish these little publications. It would have been really expensive, and the community was generally poor. So what kind of sense did it make for ministers who were paid very poorly to spend whatever little bit of extra money they had to put together and publish little pamphlets and booklets of songs? And of course it came to me, because it was just a distinct revelation, very simple revelation, the people already knew. The people already knew the music. They already knew it. And so having the songs, having the words actually printed, having the lyrics there for them was simply a guide to them for their continued singing of these songs. Um, finding those documents also allowed me to say that the uh, scholar who had made this argument, there's no tradition of black music in the Maritimes, was completely out to lunch uh, and, and completely foolhardy in making that, in making that claim. Um, and I could go on uh, and, and, and talk about other findings, other treasure troves. In fact, uh, right now I'm working on the autobiography of Howard Douglas McCurdy, Jr., Canada's first black tenured professor, 1959, University of Windsor, microbiologist, published uh, 50 different essays on gliding bacteria. Uh, wow. Uh, and and uh, uh, was also a member of parliament for two terms, 18, sorry, 1984 to 1993 uh, for Windsor. I actually worked for him from 87 to 91. Uh, so uh, some reason why he approached me to ask me to edit his his autobiography. And so to do that, I had to look up a whole lot of stuff. I had to be reminded of a whole lot of stuff. And one of them was the very simple fact that Howard really wanted me to know or to realize uh, was the fact that he named the New Democratic Party in 1961. He was at the convention. He named it. The New Democratic Party, because the party elders wanted to call it the New Party. And he had just, he and his wife had just had their first child, and he made the point at the convention that, you know, you wouldn't call your, your, your newborn child the new baby. So, you know, you might want to think about adding another term in there than just simply New Party. So it became New Democratic Party uh, for that reason. Uh, but very few people tend to recognize the fact that he did that. Uh, and and uh, and so uh, visiting his archives uh, has been an amazing uh, uh, series of discoveries for me in terms of understanding the history of the black community of Essex County, Ontario. Uh, and I will just say, as I only got a couple minutes left, but I will just say that that um, the most important thing I've ever been able to do as any kind of researcher scholar teacher, writer, is to investigate archives, get into archives, because that is where the information that you need to move forward is located. 